right. Well, we might get, we will, we will get started and hopefully my dogs don't bark. That's always, <laughs> the, that's always the fun side of doing this from home, I think. Um, yeah. So tonight, thank you so much to Sarah from Sarah's Moto Physio to Go. She's the owner and physiotherapist that is joining us this evening. So thank you much. Thank you so much, Sarah, for coming on tonight and sharing your wisdom. So Sarah isn't your average physio. She's also a motocross rider and competitor and very passionate um, about physiotherapy and also motorsport. And she's a wonderful uh, advocate for women in motorsport as well. So we're very grateful to have, to have Sarah as part of our Race Chicks community and uh, as part of our Race Chicks family. So thank you so much, Sarah. And I will hand over to yourself. Awesome. Um, thank you for that awesome introduction. I was not <laughs> expecting that. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us tonight and popping on. Um, I just want to start by introducing myself just without with furthering on from what you said, because I didn't plan that intro. Um, so yeah, I travel around everywhere. I'm based on the Gold Coast um, myself, but I have like a clinic on wheels, which I sort of use to service the trackside events, um, mainly motocross at this stage. Um, but I'm planning to expand that next year and get into the other motorsports like carts and cars and things like that and super bikes and that sort of thing as well. Um, so I do my servicing from home, um, you know, uh, workplaces and online and also, yeah, track sides and sporting events and things. Um, and I work at uh, the Gold Coast Wake Park as well, um, which is pretty awesome. So it's the first thing, like the first of its kind to be track side at motocross and things like that just ready services available for the athletes and also at the wake park comps and things. Um, so I work with the pro wakeboarders out there. So I've got two world champions. I work alongside of there, which is, might not have heard of them, um, Angelica Schreiber and Maddie Hassler. So they've won the world's, um, Angela's done it twice in a row and looking for a third this year or next year because of COVID. Um, but yeah, so pretty high end athletes and then motocross, similar sort of thing. So I'm treating like the, sort of up and coming rising stars of it and also the like pretty high end athletes there like the pros and things like that track side um i work with recovery centers on the gold coast as well because i have a huge passion for recovery and injury prevention which is uh awesome that i've got this talk because i'm very passionate about that aspect of it not so much well not not so much but as well as injury management which is like i guess the primary focus for a physio um, I'm all about the, you know, recovery and, you know, prevention of it as well. Um, I also treat general population as well. So even though I'm very much into the sport and things like that, I'm also, you know, doing the oldies and things like that and just the kids and, you know, general injuries and post-op stuff. Um, I haven't had much experience with cars and carts um, as in real life trackside stuff, but I'm super, super keen to get into that, um, like I was saying. Um, but I do know that a lot of things like, in this speech will sort of, um, I guess, cross over. So a lot of things apply to, it doesn't matter what sport you're doing. Um, it's sort of a bit of crossover with that. Um, so with injury, so I'll talk about injury prevention and recovery, obviously. Um, and within that, there's certain, um, I guess, sections that I run through. Um, so I think I've lost my place. One sec. <laughs> Um, so across all sports, you've got things like individual training programs, like strength, warm up, stretch and recovery sort of things. And then you've got your pre-race, pre-training, pre-riding, like um, mindset, strapping, warm up, hydration, um, things like that. And also rehabilitation. So post-injury or surgery, I think anything like that, you've really got to get that, um, you know, regardless of what you're doing sport wise, it could be footy. You've got to nail that on the head. Um, and, you know, see out your, re your rehabilitation plan till it's actually optimised. Um, and then you've got prehab stuff. So coming out of an injury and transitioning into sport is different again. So you've got your rehab, which is intricate little things is what I'm doing for my shoulder at the moment. And then once you've got all that strong, you've got your range back. You then do, you transition to a prehab thing, which is like more like activation before you jump on the bike or in the car or in the carts or whatever sport you're doing. Um, so it's a bit of a warm up sort of activation movement pattern type of thing to ensure that everything gets activated and you don't re-injure essentially, like you're strong enough to get into it. 
Um, and also across sports, you've got to keep continuous training. So pre-season, during season, post-season, like you can't just sort of train while you're racing and then have a bit of a break. Like if you want to be good, you've got to sort of just kind of don't stop, but just adjust it, you know, um, the different variables in the training. Um, so talking about injury prevention. So there's a few different things that I personally sort of think injury prevention is. So you've got warm-ups that prevents injuries, um, recovery. And there's a lot to do with things, aspects of that. Um, Post-injury recovery, like I was talking about, and the re-injuring that previous injury if it's not strong enough or, you know, it doesn't have that function optimised. Um, and then you've got specific training strength stuff. So the specificity of training. So, you know, motocross riders will have a different sort of training plan to like a go-kart racer or, you know, just it's, it varies. So a lot of it, the baseline stuff's the same. But if you want to get really good, again, you've got to do um, specific stuff to your sport. Um, and then mindset. So obviously, regardless of the sport, you've got to have your mindset optimal. Um, we'll run through all of these in more detail. Um, so before the race. So I'm just going to break it up between before the race, between races and after the race, just briefly. So um, oh, also, if anyone has any questions as I'm going, just shoot them out rather than forget about them or you know, wait till the end, it's all good. Um, so before races, you've got to warm up. So I can't tell you how many times that I've turned up to a track and, um, you know, cause I go to most events and I see no one jump, jump in the warmups, like expect, except for my clients that are doing, you know, doing track side. But, and even in winter, like when your body is cold, and your blood distribution is all about like protecting its central organs and things. It's not about the peripheral blood flow. So it's even more sort of important um, to get your blood flow going out here and down in your legs um, to yeah, warm up for your sport. Um, and also warming up sort of instead of, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced a similar thing, but like warming up sort of, if you just say, if you don't warm up and you're, I'm going to use motocross again, cause it's just my, this is the thing that you know i'm a rider and that's just how i set my examples at the moment but if you don't warm up and then you say you're on the race gate or even as a car like you're just coming off the line you're ready to go or go-karts or whatever the sport actually and then you sort of do the first two laps and that's your warm-up essentially so if you don't warm up you know you're using your first two laps of an important race meet whatever it is as a warm-up which that to me is not that's not what you should be searching for um, so yeah, so warming up is really important. And then you, I'll just briefly touch on, obviously you've got your hydration and your carbohydrates and stuff like that, um, before a race and during the race and the day before and all those things. Um, but it's important to note too, that, um, if you lose, I think it's between two, two and three percent or around that percent of body weight in fluid. It actually, um, has a dramatic effect on your performance. Like it's only a small amount, but it, it does usually like impede your performance so it's probably something that everyone should start drinking more water um and then also on top of that you get increased injury risk so obviously that comes alongside of that um so also strapping so before races like it's really handy like a lot of people come really early to my clinic and like you know 6 30 7 o'clock and strapping all their stuff up because they want extra support and stability in their muscles and they want to race like they've got a race or they'll lose their points so um that's a huge thing that i offer and that people do take advantage of now um and then your mental preparation so you want to be super focused so you know a lot of these um motorsports are just you're a one-man band like just you in that helmet so it's quite easy to lose your focus and you know when you're on that starting line you've got to be super focused and you haven't you can't be overstressed either like you've just got to be sort of focused relaxed to a degree and you know ready to jump out the line so i put a huge ad to get onto mindset um as well and then sleep sleep is a huge thing so sleep in terms of recovery but also for performance so you want to get um you know the optimal amount of sleep um before a race but just in general especially if you're training like off the bike or off the carts or off, i don't know how you say that sort of stuff but out of the cars and stuff training through the week uh, so you definitely have to be getting getting good sleep because um, if you don't get good sleep, uh, everything you might as well just give up on every other bit of recovery, to be honest. 
um, the, the good sleep is where it's at. It, it's the only time where your body can completely just get rejuvenated and just repair itself and just completely just shut off. Um, so obviously there's different amounts of sleep for different people. So a lot of people are like, I can run off five hours of sleep and you might be able to run off five hours of sleep. I run around five hours of sleep at uni because I actually have to, maybe sometimes less than that. But if you want to actually perform right and do the right repair and recovery for yourself, you've really got to think about sleep uh, as a number one. And with that, different ages require different amounts of sleep. So when you're younger, you're, you know, I think it's 13, 12 to 13 hours, like a lot of sleep, like toddler. Adolescence is about nine to 10. And then we're about uh, seven to eight is probably a really good starting point if you can get into that. Um, okay. So between races, so um, I have a lot of athletes come to me between their races, especially if they're in two um, what do you call it? classes. So they're doing like six, seven races a day. And sometimes they can be, you know, between 10 and 20 minutes long. Um, so they come to me and just get some like in between sports recovery massages in between their races and just get the blood flow going instead of like to the forearms or in the back. If you've got a bit of back ache or strain. Um, I have recovery boots that I'm going to be launching at the end of the year. Uh, so they're the Normatec ones, which um, I think a lot of people will jump on because that's also, in essence, um, it doesn't replace a massage, but it's pretty close to it. Like it'll, if you've got tight calves, for instance, or whatever, they have arm ones now. You know, you can, if you've got sore arms, it's a nice way to get the blood flow moving in between races or even just say you've got a two day event, you can get a really good recovery massage and put those on at the end of the race day for the following day. Um, after a race, so recovery, like I just mentioned, recovery massages, but stretch and mobility programs. So I offer a lot of these online. So it's important um, that you do stretch and actually recover your body up a bit, um, especially if you've got, um, I don't know how many two day events do the cars and carts have? Do they have two day sort of things or? So you have some like titles and things like that are usually two and three day. Three days. Okay, cool. Well, this definitely applies to you guys. <laughs> Try and have, yeah, some recovery in between. Um, generally though, if it's just one day of um, racing or whatever, or training, maybe you might do some intense, a full intense day of training and you, it's like a race day really for your body. Um, sorry, I just read that message. Um, I forgot my place now. So the next day, um, you really need to let recovery take its, take its toll. Like you have to just let yourself recover. So active recovery days are really good for that sort of thing. Um, but in a case where you've got, like you were saying, a day of racing, then, you know, another day of racing. And then, so you can actually assist that acute short-term recovery with those things that I was saying. Um, but generally it's best to just sort of let your body recover itself because it's just essentially adapting and yeah, doing the right thing for your body. Um, active, yeah, active recovery day, like I just mentioned. So it's best to kind of, if you're a high end athlete too, or looking to be, it's best to not rest the next day. It's best to just get your body moving, go for a walk, jump on a soccer bike, just cruise, go for a little swim in the pool or a few laps, like something like that. Um, and then obviously sleep, which I just touched on before, which is really important. Um, so tips for injury prevention. So always do off the bike training, which, um, obviously is really important. Um, so you can't just sort of expect you yourself to perform at the best level. If all you're doing is weekend, you know, events and things like that, um, or just not even doing any exercise at all. Um, so you need to sort of train to the loads the specific loads that you're placing on your body. So like I said before, with the warm up thing, it's, it's similar, like with the strength training stuff, you want to have um, like stupid example, I guess, but a golfer would obviously have a different strength training program to a go-kart racer or a motocross rider or anything like that. So it always has to be specific to the sport. So you can't, it's great to do like an all over like gym class, that's great. Like obviously you'll have adaptions and you'll get um, gains and strength and cardiovascular fitness and that's all good. But if you're really looking to get an extra edge, you really need to have it specific um, to the sport. 
um, and sometimes you can even replicate close movements of that particular sport you're in um, in the program, which is really cool. And I offer those as well. And um, my athletes get a lot out of that. Um, and also sort of building strength and control. Um, so in your muscles, so it's not so much about just the strength. It's about the power and the control because the strength in your muscles is like, a, if you think of it like the scaffold of your joints. Um, so it obviously offers good performance, but it's great at protecting you for, from injuries, obviously. So, you know, if you fall off, you've got a bit of scaffolding there. You're not going to rely on your bones and your ligaments and that to just, you know, cop the load. You're going to have a strong reinforcement system in your joints, which is um, pretty awesome. Um, to decrease the load between, um, through any given joint, you have to have optimal strength and power. Um, and for that, you have to have optimal range. So really, you can get a lot of strength out of... Um, you know, moving your arms and you, a lot of people don't even notice that they're actually missing a few degrees of range, you know, unless you assess yourself and think, Oh God, that's a bit wrong or some hip movements and you just see, okay, that's a bit, that's not the same as the other one. Um, but generally if you don't have full range of motion, then you can't get the actual optimal amount of strength out of that joint and that muscle. So it's super important that people take care of their mobility and stretching because you've got especially if you've had a surgery or an injury because that's when people just start to become pain-free and they go oh yeah i'm feeling pretty good and then they just don't they don't think about it but they're the people that generally will have um, a re-injury or something up up or down the, i'm just using my shoulder as an example but um you know up and down the train later in life because they haven't got optimal range in that joint um what i'm up to so also training for um, control and reaction time and things like that. So you've got, um, you can kind of assist with something I call biomechanical correction. So for example, uh, I don't know how much you guys know about motocross, but if you're riding motocross and you're going over the whoops, like the rolly thingies and you cross up, you know, that's, that's something that this can definitely help with, like doing a specific training program with reaction time and control. Um, so your body is quicker to, I guess, avoid that injury and it can help. I mean, sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes you're going to eat the dirt and taste it and that's just what happens. But, you know, other times, you, you know, you can try your best and this is, this is how you can try your best and avoid and try to avoid injuries as much as you can. Um, and the other aspect is it like the super bikes, like if you're sliding around a corner and things like that, even dirt, dirt track, um, you know, when you're sliding and then you could hit like a bump or something like that, it's probably optimal. Like this can help with that as well, like reaction time and control with your muscles. Um, I guess with a situation like that, though, you could probably, um, I don't know if you can do this, but like actually practice in that scenario and get yourself good at sort of correcting the wrong things. Like I'm not saying chuck a boulder out in front of you and try to avoid it or something stupid like that, but it's really good like just to try, try it out, like in a controlled environment. And then that way your body just remembers that and is quicker to react. So it's actually a huge safety, safety thing as well. Um, I won't say that. Um, so, and just out of the research sort of thing, I'll just touch on this. So the, if you have strong hip stabilizers, like hip abductor muscles and quads at the front of your leg, um, you're less likely to have, um, anterior knee pain, so front of knee pain in general. So if you've got strength in your hips and your legs, you're already up on, you know, you've already got one up on the knee pain because that's very, very common to get anterior knee pain uh, front of the knee, knee pain. Um, so I've already touched on the specific warm-ups and strength, uh, sorry, stretch and recovery plans. So that's really important. Um, I offer those online and trackside as well. Um, so I offer... One sec, my computer just went weird. So CTI braces as well. So um, I, when I first started my business, I didn't really want to get involved with things like that. But um, being a rider myself and seeing so many people also come up to me and like they're using these shocking braces, they're having like ACL injuries, like meniscal injuries, ligament injuries and things like that in their knee. So I then researched around the braces. And I know that a lot of the other sports out there, like your car racing, wouldn't need any brace or, you know, go-karts and stuff like that.
but just around the, the protection and injury prevention and re-injury, CDI are the best because you can actually, um, like literally I do the measurements of your knee, take photos and that, that gets sent to um, the US to the orthopod team and then they'll actually create a leg that is like yours except a foam leg and they will mold that brace directly to you. So there's no other product out there. Um, and this is for um, people that haven't, like that have had knee injury and then they just want to brace for protection and stuff like that. Like I do them for surfers and wakeboarders and that too. Um, but they're just the best thing around. And now I advocate for them. I get nothing out of it. I don't, don't get any extra, you know, money or endorsements or anything. I just really love them. And I really think that they are the best, best in the market. So, yeah. Uh, also electrolytes. So electrolytes are super important. Um, they get lost in sweat and you need to replace them because they're important in cellular processes and the muscle contractile um, capacity. Um, so, and also ATP production, which is essentially energy production um, that occurs at a cellular level in your muscles and tissues. So you've really got to keep those going, especially when it's hot. Um, all right, tips to warm up. Anyone got any questions about any of that? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I sent one through. But yeah, maybe just Kaz's question. Uh, what do you what think was, of the massage guns? What do I personally think? Yeah. They're not specific enough. They're really not, yeah. So, for example, I do a special arm pump treatment at the track because arm pump is a huge concern. Like, it's a huge thing um, in motocross and people just aren't sure how to address it. And I do a specific treatment there and then on the track and it involves you know, do, moving the joint and doing active stuff and trying to get that um, discomfort gone. So I guess they, they do do something, but for me, like you're talking about the pulsing. The Athera gun, Athera? Athera. Is, that the, is that the one with the ball and the pulsing thing? Yeah, yeah. 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 Diff, different ones, like, um, you know, different sort of levels of different ones. And I know, you know, a lot of, a few PTs, that I know I'm a PT as well, um, using them, using them with athletes um, as well. Yeah. For, for, you know, for somebody that's not, you know, a, obviously a physio or a masseuse or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're not, they're not terrible, but I think there's, to my personal opinion, they're not specific enough. And if you wanted to um, address a specific muscle or muscle group or joint or something like that, it's probably best to like for maybe you, you said you're a PT, is that correct? Yeah, you're a coach, yeah. 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 yeah, so it's probably best for you to like kind of like assess the situation and assess like what's tight and whatever and maybe just give them sort of like more, uh, what, how do you say, like something like they can do to their, say it is their arm, like instead of just punching away with a gun, it's yeah. probably best to do some stretches and some active release and just get in there like that instead of just pumping away like that. Yeah. But if you've got nothing, then yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's all right. No worries. Um, anything else? Nope. All good? All right. Um, so tips to warm up. So don't do static stretching. Uh, and uh, I see it done a lot. And what I mean by static stretching is um, like a prolonged hold. Like I'm using my forearm because that's just easy at the moment, but a prolonged hold stretch. So you don't want to be doing any of that kind of thing. You want it to keep it dynamic and moving the joints and moving the tissues before you jump on a bike. Um, so the reason for that is that it reduces the ability um, of the contraction, like the strength of the contraction, and it slows down the action potential, which is essentially the signal that comes from the brain to the muscle. Um, it slows that down. So not only is the speed of the contraction reduced, but um, it affects the strength as well. So your reaction time's down, the speed's down, the strength's down. So it's just all over, just crap for it. So spread the word, because I still see a lot of that happening. <laughs> um, so keep it dynamic. Um, how do you get the most out of the warm up? So uh, you want to increase the body temperature and the blood flow. Like, absolutely, that's one of the huge things but also you want to make sure that you're activating the nerve endings to your muscles. So that's the biggest thing that actually occurs when you do a proper warm up. Um, Cause you want those signals firing, you want the muscles activated and they're all like primed, ready to go. Um, 
So it needs to be a quite a large percentage of your max contraction. So I don't mean to, you know, get the heaviest weight you've got and take it to the track and, you know, do a bicep curl or something stupid. Um, but just talking in layman's terms, like maybe a push up, like that's pretty much, that'll be good. Like in terms of how much just doing a, a full push up would be probably a good example of the amount of contraction you've got that you'll need. Um, so basically you want to do movements that prepare your body um, and your joints, like muscles, tendons, ligaments, and um, whatever you'll be working on for whatever exercise you're doing. So it might be diff it probably, it definitely should be different for if you're sort of getting in your car to do a race or, or a go-kart or anything for that matter, or um, just casually, you know, doing a exercise class, uh, you know, doesn't matter it should be specific to what you're doing. So you've got to make sure that your movements are closely, rep um, they closely replicate what you're about to do out on the track. So as close as possible. Um, another tip, don't fatigue yourself. So don't, you know, do a massive hit sesh beforehand, sweating, you're like, oh my God, I'm exhausted. And then you're on the line. Like that's not how it goes down. Um, so you just want to do as much as you can to take the edge off. Um, so what I was saying before about, um, the first two laps of an event, I'm just using that as an example, that can be a warm up. It's not ideal, but that's often what happens. And you wanna make sure that it's about 50 to 60% of your max heart rate, uh, roughly. So you don't wanna be like you've just done a VO2 max test where you're just like flat out sweating and just can't even catch your breath. That's not a good thing. Um, and you wanna sort of do it between like there's no real set time like when you would sort of start do your warm-up prior to the race but you definitely want to make sure that it's at least like half hour maybe 45 minutes even an hour before i probably wouldn't leave it at more than an hour but probably half hour 45 minutes is probably a good a good um time frame um also anything that you do um or that's prescribed to you um and this goes for nutrition and all sorts of things too i'm kaz i'm being that you get your athletes to trial it before they get out onto the track, like oh, that race day. Sorry. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So it's you want that race day. It's about the whole lead up. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. So you yeah. might try this warm up. In my case, a warm up or something specific like that, and then it just doesn't work out for you, or you, you know, you've got to find that fine line balance. And you, you sure as hell don't want to be finding that on the race day. You want to have that all down pat and sweet before then. Um, and then mindset. So warm up. That's a, that's a huge thing. Like I was saying before, like mindset, your mindset, um, visualization, self-talk, like it all helps to prevent injuries. You know, you've got to be on your A game. Um, so common injuries for drivers. So I've, as I said, I haven't been trackside. I'd love to be, but um, I haven't been had the chance yet. Um, from what I've been told, it's a lot of um, overuse injuries of like the wrist, hands, elbows, lower back pain, neck, shoulders, like similar things like that, because they're not necessarily moving like that on like compared to a motocross bike. It's more endurance. Like they've got to last out in that one position and it's like a prolonged position. Like you're sitting um, flexed for quite some time in some situations. Um, Oh, I've just got a little note here that the pit crew members often, um, you know, they'll have a lot of overuse injuries as well because they're, you know, working on all the stuff with the, uh, you guys know more about this than me, but like changing wheels and all sorts of things like they, they need a bit of attention as well. Um, so I, I guess I would love to just educate drivers of uh, carts and cars as well about, you know, training outside of driving. So you need to do after tra training, like I was saying before, like it's super important, even though you're still, you're sitting there in a car, but it's still tiring and you still need endurance and you still need specific strength. Um, you still need mindset. You still need all that sort of thing. Um, and fatigue, uh, I haven't actually driven a car before, um, like in that sort of situation. So I can't say firsthand, but from what I gather, um, and from the research, fatigue is like a secondary weakness. So if you have like um, a lapse of a, t like if you're fatigued, even your brain's fatigued, like forget your body for a sec, if your brain's fatigued as well, and that's where nutrition comes into it too, Kaz, with keeping your brain alert, like it also obviously has a lot to play with that. It's um, responsible for mistakes um, and then you've got an injury potentially. So, yeah. Um, 
so tips for recovery. So stretch and recovery. So this is where you can do your stretch, like prolonged hold stretches. Really, really cool, really good. Keep your mobility, um, you know, stretch everything out because everything's super tight because it's just been worked, especially if you've just had a race or, you know, played sport or whatever it is. Um, and so I um, actually do the mobility assessments online and on the track side as well. So like I was saying before, people don't realise that they're a few degree off. Sometimes they're more than a few degree off and they just don't push it into that range because they never feel the pain. So they never sort of get it addressed. So it's something that I'd like to promote because um, quite often, you know, I do the assessment and then there's something going on and then I give them a plan and then, you know, they translate that into their sport and their training and it works out really well. Uh, recovery days. So as I was saying before, an active recovery day after a race um, is really important. Like I was saying before, you just easy sort of cardio stuff like swimming, cycling, walking, stuff like that, just to allow your muscles to like actively recover without pushing it too hard. Oh, and also it's quite easy for people to like experience that really bad muscle soreness. And they're like, I just want to sit down and they sit down like, and they just get more stiff essentially. So get into that. Um, sleep. So uh, I'm handing on about sleep because it's super, super important, but um, it's the most effective type of recovery. Like I've said before, you've got to make sure you fall asleep quickly and deeply. So the length of time, theoretically, that you sleep, um, theoretically, you get that deeper sleep in a longer sleep, if that makes sense, because you've got time to get into that deep REM sleep. Um, and it increases the, um, hormones, specifically HDH, so that's human growth hormone. Um, which resets the body. Um, you get actually makes you a little bit leaner naturally through your sleep, which is pretty cool. Um, it speeds up healing. Um, and after an injury, it, it aids in like repairing muscle, repairing your muscles from, because essentially when you do any exercise, your muscles are, they need repair. They're a bit like micro, you can call it micro damage. So they always need repair and sleep is awesome. And it's easy to do. <laughs> um, and also, for the ladies that like the skin appearance, it actually helps with quality of skin appearance. So, you know, get into that. Whatever floats your boat, just get more sleep. <laughs> um, and eat more protein. So again, Kaz, you know more about this as well, um, but high quality protein as well and high quality fats before you go to sleep actually helps you sleep. So if you're going to bed hungry, um, the research has shown that you actually will take longer to fall asleep and not have a deep enough sleep. So it's important that you just have a little snack before bed. Uh, I've been told that ice cream is all right, but not obviously not the whole tub, but like maybe a small little bowl, but it's got good pro on a, it's got protein and it's got fats in it. So it does the trick. Um, have a dark room. So obviously the darker the room, the better. Um, you got no stimulus um, around you. Make it cold. Well, not cold, cold, but it's proven that to have, if you're just sort of nice and comfortable and not too hot and not too cold, you get a way better sleep as well. So that probably explains why when we're, when it's summer, you know, everyone's dripping with sweat and got all oh, got the aircon cranking if you have aircon. So yeah, you get a better sleep in that way. No distractions, no sound. So, um, you know, you really should have like, Every light, like even if you've got a TV, some people, some of my clients, they have like the light on the TV, like, you know, that little light that sort of is there, always there, like just, or an alarm clock, just, just that light. And they actually can't fall asleep unless they cover it up. And that's a really small light in a, in a decent sized bedroom. So, uh, yeah. So keep the sounds away. And even, even like to the point with your phones, like when they vibrate. So it's like, zzz, that can actually keep, and you might not think it does because you're, falling asleep but your brain is just trained like it's just the body it will just direct its attention to whatever it is a noise whatever like that and it will just take you longer to get to sleep and if you can't get to sleep between 15 20 minutes you, sh you should probably just get back up and just chill out and do something else because obviously you're not going to fall asleep like it's probably best to not just try just to jump back up um a few more things on sleep so acute sleep loss um, which means just a short um, amount of time. So it could be over a, a week, um, just say. So in pairs, this is translating to performance now, not so much on the other things. Um, so it actually impairs decision-making. Um, it creates, this is research proven, 
um, negative mindset. So, you know, you wake up with more negative mindset. Um, you're more distracted. So especially before a race, like you want to get real good sleep because you don't want to be distracted. Um, you don't want to have a negative mindset and you just don't want to be tired, but um, it actually increases your emotional state. So, you know, you can, I don't know, but I, I'm one to like get more emotional when I'm tired. So I can definitely resonate with that. Um, and night workers obviously have it really bad because that's really bad for your body cycle to do an overnight shift, especially when they've got like the overnight shift and then they go back into days and they do a night again. Like it's just a terror. It's your body isn't designed for that kind of thing. Um, Oh, just going about, uh, I think I've already set up do online specific, specific warm ups and recovery programs. I think I've said that already. Um, mobility assessments said that already and arm pump prevention program. So I'm just about to release uh, my arm pump prevention program. So it's specific to forearms um, because purely because well, one of my rider, but two at the track, I'm just constantly getting people go, how do I help my arm pump? How do I get rid of this pain here? Like, how do I, I can't hold on anymore. So I do treat this track side, like I said, but I've now developed an online eight week program that's specific design, specifically designed around um, that, the athletes. Um, I don't really think I have anything else. <laughs> Does anyone want to say anything else? <laughs> great. And I'm a hundred percent saying that I'm allowed ice cream before I go to bed. Well, I, you know, try something like that. I, you know, I'd give it a go because the whole I thing, myself, the whole I'm... thing you've talked about that <laughs> what Michelle took out of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well now i'm gonna expect some feedback you try it out and then talk to me <laughs> then contact me for a nutrition plan to lose weight yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 i'm just simply do yeah well not on keto <laughs> <laughs> all right so we've got um so it's um had a, a question in regards to how to deal with chronic uh neck and shoulder pain that gets aggravated by racing Aggravated by racing. Okay, so it probably depends on previous injury. So if this person has had a previous neck injury or a shoulder injury or even like an upper back injury, um, sometimes if they're not addressed properly, um, and like I was saying about the full range of motion and doing the proper rehab and things like that, if that's not actually addressed right, it's going to just have long-term implications. So that's probably what's going on. Um, how to fix it now would probably be to get yourself an assessment with a physio or I'd suggest a physio um, and just get your range of motion optimal, do some stretching and specific strengthening stuff um, because yeah, that's probably the best way to fix it without seeing the actual condition like in real time at the moment. That's probably the only thing I can really say um, and figure out if there's an actual injury still there. If you know, cause quite often, if there's pain and tightness, people sometimes overlook that there's an actual injury causing the pain and tightness. Um, so I'll probably look into that a little bit further, to be honest. But try some stretching, especially for the neck and the shoulder. Um, okay. It yeah. will help. Sorry, I should have said that was Stephanie's question. Stephanie, did you have any other follow-up or, or any other questions in, in regards to that? Um, not really. I do see a physio. I've been on and off with them because I've, like, I don't actually know when this pain started. And it's not from an injury and we've done like an MRI to check as well and everything is fine. It's just like tight as like it's all the way into my skull and halfway down like well, my shoulder blade as well. And so it's just like it always I don't notice it when I'm at the track and when I'm racing. But like the next day when it's like wash up day and you just finish the day and like my whole shoulder is like up around my ear and like it's yeah we don't seem to know what's causing it and we're just trying to like chip away at it but yeah yeah i probably now you've told me that you get it after it's probably to do with the endurance thing uh, yeah. with your muscles as well um it could be even a neural thing so sometimes like your nerves because they all stem from your you know spinal cord up the top corn mm. corn spinal cord up the top yeah. um and then quite often like you can get um, a hypersensitive nerve or maybe even compression on a bit of the nerve um, and that also can cause um, shoulder pain and tightness and things like that. So that could, that could be something to address. Like 
get your physio to address, uh, assess your neural tension in your upper limb yeah. um, and just check that out. Cool, I will. Thank you. My props. Wonderful. Has anyone else got any questions for Sarah? Uh, I have a question. I have a calcium buildup in my shoulder. So racing really hurts because like holding my arm like this right now, I get a pain all through here. So racing, doing this, that, that really hurts. So after a full day, so I do rally, which is a lot of bouncing around and moving. So at the end of the day, my shoulder and my arm is really sore. Um, I've had physio, I've done Bowen therapy. I've tried um, uh, anti-inflammatories. The next step they're telling me is a cortisone injection and I'm not real keen on that. Um, just is there anything else you can suggest? Um, where's the calcium? Where do you know whereabouts that calcium buildup is sitting? Not is it exactly. the, they said it's in the shoulder, but they haven't told me where exactly. It sounds like it could be um, sort of below your AC joint, like in that little gap. I think I doubt it would be in your actual shoulder, shoulder joint itself, like just outside the shoulder. It's common to get that kind of thing, unless you've had. Um, shoulder surgery or previous shoulder injury it's just developed has it um i we think it might have been like an rsi injury so i work in an office and for years like this with the phone in the crook of your neck talking so they're thinking that's what's caused it um, i don't do that anymore works one out and bought me a headset um so this has been ongoing for 15 years um yeah but i've only been racing for about four oh, so I, I didn't really, I started noticing, I used to kayak a lot and you notice it when you're doing the kayaking movements. Um, and then I stopped doing that, trying to get it sorted. And then yeah, you don't notice it unless you're doing an activity where you're actually using that movement. Um, it does impact my sleep a lot. I went and bought a brand new pillow to try and make sure that I'm laying straight, all that sort of stuff, so. Yeah, yeah. and the pillow, does it, do you prop your arm off on the pillow or is that just for your head? The pillow. Um, no, I have a pillow next to me so that my arm is at the right height because yeah. if you don't, it pulls and yeah, it pulls across. And if I lay on it, I get pins and needles in my arm. So I, I get very broken sleep. Yeah. yeah, well, you probably find that it's probably sitting. Um, I can't really show, I don't have a picture or anything to show you, but I think it's sitting like in between this little space. And quite often, when you do anything like above 90 degrees like that, it'll impinge on it. Yeah. Um, and then what might happen, what might have happened to you is that it's just been going over that long that like there's a little burst of sack that sits in between that space. And if it gets impinged enough, it just gets really angry and it's full of nerve endings. So you, so that's what they'll probably inject. Um, if they're going to inject you there. Um, however, that's not going to stop the actual problem. So the problem is by bi it's a biomechanical problem. So you'll probably find, um, I don't know what your physio has done with you, but for me, it's the first thing that popped up into my mind um, was it wasn't stretching, it was strengthening. So there's specific ways you can strengthen your scapular muscles um, and your whole shoulder complex to get stronger and actually move better. So it doesn't actually impinge so much on, on the joint. But if it's, if it's something quite big, like I don't, I don't know about, what your scan looks like and how big the actual bony prominence is. Sometimes they go in and shave it off because actually no matter what you do, it's going to keep pushing. You know what I mean? Like keep. I'm going for another ultrasound next week to see. I had one about uh, 12 months ago. So they're sending me for another ultrasound this week to see if there's been any change. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, well, if you want to, do you want to send that, a image across to me and I'll just have a quick look at it and just give my opinion to you because I think in most cases you can just uh, do heaps like specific strengthening stuff really can help with that just help your movement help your strength help to keep that gap um you know not to close up as much it just it's just certain musculature that will help like strengthening that stuff up yeah that's right wonderful has anyone else got a question We have one uh, that came through from Jenny, which is, is there life after frozen shoulder? <laughs> Good old frozen shoulder. Um, so in physio terms, that's called adhesive capsulitis. 
Um, and in the name, you can kind of guess that it, adhesive means sort of stuck together. So it's quite a debilitating. Um, is this lady on the call actually? Um, I don't think she is. No? So it's all good. I can yeah. keep going. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what happens is it's like a fibrosis essentially. It just means stiffening, hardening of the actual glenohumeral joint um, in the shoulder there. So there's a lot of fluid that sits in there and everything just becomes like stuck and normally it moves and you know moves in and out when you move your shoulder and the pressure can equalize and everything's great but with this it, it's just like super glue almost and there's um there's life after it i'll answer the question first sorry there is life after it um although sometimes like even to physios it's a bit of a mystery as to one why it starts in the first place and how long it actually takes to recite so sometimes you can have, um, you can get it from say post-surgery. So that's a common one. So if you've just had surgery in the shoulder, um, in the joint more so, you can, you're more like likely to, to get that sort of thing. Um, there's thought to be some hormone sort of thing around it. So the hormone imbalances sort of trigger it off in women because it's more common in women, unfortunately. So between, I think, well, over 40 years of age, uh, it's way more common and men, very rarely ever get it. I've never seen a case in a man, in a man. Um, and quite often, unfortunately, you get, you get it in one arm and sometimes it'll come back in that, that same arm years later or even translate across to the other side, which is really annoying. Um, and there's three stages to it. So you've got um, your freezing stage and it's all really typical, easy to follow, freezing. So your shoulder is freezing. So you've got um, more pain than reduced range. And then you've got the frozen, which is like, the pain sort of subsides, but you're stiff as hell and you just can't, you just can't move um, essentially. Well, you can move a little bit, but it's really stuck. It's not, it's not very, it's not a very good condition at all. Um, and every case is different. So, you know, people can sort of, the symptoms can reside and can get near, near optimal function. So it's, it's in most cases, unfortunately, you don't actually get your full range back. Um, so you can get close to it, but, it's very rare that you get everything sweet and it's all gone and you, you're great. You know, you've got all your range. Um, and sometimes it can take, you know, between a few months to even like years to go through the process. So the stages, they can just prolong and just drag out. But physio definitely helps like getting that shoulder moving in the appropriate ways. So obviously it's all stuck. So you've got to know what to do and it's like passive assisted movements and a lot of joint mobilizations from physios and, you know, stretching and things like that, just to get everything going. Cause you've got to keep it going. That's the trick. As soon as you know, you have that condition. Um, yeah. Get into a physio and get everything going, get everything moving. Cause otherwise it'll just happen quicker and it'll be more severe. So, um, yeah. Well, it doesn't sound good at all. And yeah, no. it's great. Just something else we get and have to deal with. <laughs> Women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Any any other questions for Sarah? Anything that that's popped into your minds? Can oh, just, back? just quickly, can you just uh, tell that lady that had that question that she can contact me and we can actually look at it, what stage she's at and what she's doing treatment wise. Just thought yeah. I'd say that real quick. Okay. Yeah. Forget. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's actually two, there was somebody else I know that, um, that has it as well. Um, and she really got us tonight. Yeah. 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 And just, and just be careful. Like if you're talking to these people, I don't know how well you know them, but just, just be careful with that diagnosis of frozen shoulder. Like a lot of therapists will diagnose it as that when sometimes it's not that. So it's, it's only, um, well, I guess the really clear sign is that for a physio, um, especially external rotation. So this movement in the arm, when that's really limited is a huge sign. And also when the passive range of motion equals the active. So when, so that means um, if I've got a patient in front of me, I move their arm myself without them helping is like to there. And then also the active is to there. So that definitely means that the joint, that's, that's quite likely to be frozen shoulder. Okay. Yeah. Radio. Well, that's, yeah, good to know. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you're very gracious in offering our members a discount to your services, so to your consults, uh, sports-specific warm-up programs, sports-specific stretch and recovery, um, mobility assessments, and motivation, mindset, and accountability coaching, which is fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Would you like to expand on, on, on that offer a little bit more? Is there anything <laughs> on your online, um, what you offer online for our, so for people that aren't um, in, like on the Gold Coast that can't see you personally? Um, yes. So they can nearly still everything access I... your services. What was that last one? Sorry, that you, they can <laughs> still access your services even though they're not on the Gold Coast. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so everything I offer hands on is basically offered um, online. So you, like you were saying, um, yeah, the stretch and stuff, I can definitely assess you on an online console. It's very, very popular, especially with COVID stuff that's happened. Um, so it, I don't need to be in front of you to assess your range and to get your mobility back and to prescribe things. Like we can actually do a hell of a lot on an online console. Um, uh, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, where you can find me, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I have a website, sarahsphysiotogo.com and an email address, which is sarah at sarahsphysiotogo.com. <laughs> uh, I don't really know what else yeah. there is to say, but honestly, yeah. like if you're interested in any of those things, I'm quite happy. Like I said, just give you all the discount. I'm a huge advocate for women in motorsport. Huge, huge, huge. Like I promote like anything that I get my hands on or hear about, I'm onto it straight away. Like I'm pretty sure, um, Rochelle, when you, when I saw race chicks, like early, early yeah. days, I contacted yeah. you, I was like, this is sick. Like, <laughs> what is this? Like, I've got to be involved. Like, I love it so much. And like I said, I yeah. really want to get myself out to the other tracks next year um, and branch my wings and whatever that term is, you know, yeah. just get involved with everyone. Cause I really feel that having um, a physio track side helps so much. Like just seeing it at the motocross events, like how, you know, it, it means the difference between a, ra a racer, a rider, whatever you want to say. Um, packing up for the day because they've hurt themselves versus getting treatment and advice and still completing the end of the race day. So I just want to sort of spread that and have that available at more sort of disciplines like motorsport events. Mm -hmm. so yep. that's, that's the goal. Yeah, fantastic. And if you do have any questions, Sarah is in the group, in the Facebook group. So if you've got any questions, feel free to pop a question in there and I'm sure Sarah will be able to answer it. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's been great. Um, and to have our questions answered, which is fantastic. And yeah, we will see you at the next one. It is on about three weeks time on Tarmac Rally, which is going to be exciting. And I think biggest takeaway from today, which leads on, um, which carries, sorry, not leads on, carries on from what Kaz was saying is don't leave everything to the day before in regards to your preparation or on race day. It's all about, it's all about the lead up, isn't it? 100%. Yep. preparation yeah yep all right yep. fantastic all right well thank you and thanks, thanks everyone guys. and we'll see you all again soon radio see ya <laughs> thank bye. You. bye thank, thank you so much see you